I think that George Bush was in Dealey Plaza at the time of the assassination, but this is the picture that most people point to when they say so, when they think he was there. But this is not Bush. I think it's been very well debunked already. I'm not going to bother debunking it. I just want to make it clear that I don't think that's Bush. In fact, I think Bush by this time was on his way to Tyler, Texas. That's not Bush. I say this is Bush right here standing on Houston Street, seen here in the Bell film, standing with Throwing Man in a recent video about Throwing Man. I've gone over that. Some of why I think that's George Bush right there because he's with Throwing Man, and Throwing Man threw something at the president, and there's a police officer there who didn't do anything about it. So I think uh, whoever Throwing Man is with are important people, and Bush is an important person. And also I think standing there is Clint Murchison, standing to Bush's right. Um, I think it's, you can't identify positively from this photography because it's not very high quality, or the little part of it that he occupies is very, fuzzy, but you can clearly see it's got the same, uh, he has, this man has the same kind of hairline as George, and he's tall, just like George, and he's standing, I think, with Clint Murchison and the Murchison chauffeur there, and I think there's other reasons to think he was involved with the assassination, and there's other information to imply that he was in Dallas at the time. The assassination certainly was an inside job. The CIA is part of the inside, and there's reason to think George Bush was in the CIA in 1963, including this document from Hoover, which names a Mr. George Bush of the CIA who's being uh, informed about some things involving the assassination. And this document was first uh, brought to the public's attention by an article written by Joseph McBride. Vice President George Bush's resume is his most highly touted asset as a candidate. But a recently discovered FBI memorandum raises the possibility that, like many resumes, it uh, raises that possibility, but like many resumes, it admits some facts the applicant would rather not talk about, specifically, that he worked for the Central Intelligence Agency in 1963, more than a decade before he became its director. Why did you care about this? Well, I, uh, originally I was researching the Kennedy assassination and I was looking through FBI files that were uh, released about 10 years ago under the Freedom of Information Act and uh, I just came across George Bush's name and it was a surprise to me I didn't really know that he was with the CIA back then and uh, however I assumed at the time uh, that I found this document that everybody must know this uh, and it was just stated in the document that J. Edgar Hoover had written to the State Department a week after the assassination to summarize a briefing uh, that was given to, quote, Mr. George Bush of the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, it was about the reaction of the anti-Castro Cuban exiles in Miami to the assassination. And it, it uh, kind of piqued my interest that George Bush was involved, but I, I put it aside, and uh, when he started running for president in the current campaign, I began reading a lot more about his background, and I noticed that nobody was referring to this experience that he had. Uh, obviously, everybody knows that he became director in 1975, but nobody was commenting on the earlier period. And uh, so I began studying this very carefully and found out, according to his autobiography, he doesn't mention this uh, period. And there's a biography of him written by one of his aides in 1980. And uh, everybody says he was just an oil man at the time uh, in the, from the late 50s to the early 60s. So I began doing a story on this, and uh, his office denies this report, but I have sources who confirm that it was indeed and we have this FBI document uh, which from the day of the assassination which reports that on the day of the assassination George H.W. Bush, a respected businessman, uh, called the, the Houston office of the FBI from Tyler, Texas to report a hot tip of somebody who might have shot the president. It turns out it wasn't a serious tip but nonetheless, he did call the FBI and report James Parrott, and then later he denied, or his office at least, George doesn't go on the record denying anything himself, but his office at least denied uh, that he had made this call. And now I'm going to be showing some graphics that I put together from the Russ Baker book, Family of Secrets. I think uh, this book isn't all about the uh, 
the assassination connection, but it has a very important uh, part on that, and it has been very uh, uh, formative, contributing to be the formation of my ideas about Bush and the assassination. Anyway, I recommend that book. And regarding the parrot memo that I just uh, showed, this mentions that the Bush, Bush's press office at first said the vice president hadn't made the call and challenged the authenticity of the FBI reports. Then, several days later, an aide said Bush does not recall making the call. And this is, uh, this was in 1988, when he was running for president. So George Bush doesn't remember that on the day the president was assassinated, that he called the FBI to report a possible suspect, that is, somebody who might have shot the president, he doesn't remember that. The vice president says he wasn't there or can't recall. Now this also from Baker's book, and I want to read this because it's, it's important in the context of this video. This is the first uh, document on the record that states clearly where Bush was supposedly on the day of the assassination. It's a letter uh, that comes from uh, Barbara Bush's memoirs. She supposedly wrote this letter. The following is how the excerpts appear in the book, Barbara Bush's book, Ellipses and All. Dearest family, Wednesday I took Doris Ulmer out for lunch. They were here from England, and they had been so nice to George in Greece. That night we went to... I am writing this at the beauty parlor, and the radio says the president has been shot. Oh, Texas, my Texas, my God, let's hope it's not true. I am sick at heart, as we all are. Yes, the story is true, and the governor also. How hateful some people are. Since the beauty parlor, the president has died. We are once again on a plane, this time a commercial plane. Poppy picked me up at the beauty parlor. We went right to the airport, flew to Fort Worth, and dropped Mr. Zeppo off. We were on his plane and flew back to Dallas. We had to circle the field while the, sec while the second presidential plane took off. Immediately, Pop got tickets back to Houston, and here we are flying home. It's real time here in Barbara's letter. We are sick at heart. The tales of the radio reports Reporters tell of Jackie Kennedy are the bravest I've ever heard. The rumors are flying about that horrid assassin. We are hoping that it is not some far-right nut, but a commie nut. You understand that we know they are both nuts, but just hope that it is not a Texan and not an American at all. I am amazed by the rapid fire thinking and planning that has already be done, been done. LBJ has been the president for some time now, two hours at least, and it's only 4.30. My dearest love to you all, Bar. Now on this page we get uh, a report of what George was doing when the news of the president's death came. George stopped his speech and told the audience what had happened. In view of the president's death, he said, yada yada yada. So uh, to me it's important that this is about the death not about the shooting, because that puts the time a little more precisely. We know that Walter Cronkite, according to what I've read, Walter Cronkite reported to the nation that JFK had died at 1.38 p.m. The, the press conference that announced JFK's death at Parkland Hospital was called for 1.30 p.m. I don't know if it went off exactly on time, but we're talking probably about a time of... Uh, they wouldn't have known before 135 anyway, I don't think, in Tyler, Texas. And here it says George had just begun his speech when this news came. So what this means is that George had just begun his speech at about 135 in Tyler, Texas. And Tyler, Texas ain't that far from Dallas. In her letter, Barr mentioned having lunch with Doris Ulmer who was the wife of Al Ulmer, who was a CIA-connected person, confidant of, of CIA director Alan Dulles. And he also had something to do with a, a sh Greek shipping magnate by the name of Stavros Niarchos, 
who no doubt was a uh, rival of uh, Aristotle Onassis. I don't want to get ahead of the JFK assassination story, but I think this is relevant that Barr had just uh, had uh, lunch with, with Doris and their friends of the Bushes. Now on to the airplane that they're using for this trip, Mr. Zeppa's plane. Again from Russ Baker, besides Doris Ulmer, the other person Barbara mentioned in her letter is Mr. Zeppo, the man who had lent them his, air, his plane on November 22nd. As with so many other clues and documents concerning Poppy Bush, this one appears a dead end until one realizes that the name has been slightly misspelled. There is in fact no Mr. Zeppo, but there was a man since deceased by the name of Zeppa. Joe Zeppa founded the Tyler-based Delta Drilling Company, which became one of the world's largest contract oil drillers with operations around the globe. Barbara, in her letter, notes the use of Zeppa's plane to leave Tyler early in the afternoon on November 22nd. What she does not mention is that, in all probability, she and Poppy had also arrived on Zeppa's plane, and she does, in the letter, say, get back on the plane. So, uh... I think she does say that. It's implied, anyway. The very fact that Zeppa lent his plane to Poppy is surprising, according to Zeppa's son Keating, who was on the company business in Argentina at the time. Joe Zeppa is not a great one for having had an actual active hand in political campaign, he told me, adding, he's not one to say, here, I'll send the plane for you. If Joe Zeppa were going in a given direction and the politician wanted to go along, that was fine with him. When told that the plane bypassed Dallas's downtown Love Field, dropped Zeppa off at Fort Worth's Municipal Airport, and then backtracked to Dallas, Keating Zeppa said that that was not something that his father ordinarily would have done. Though the movements of Zeppa's plane on the afternoon of November 22nd, once it left Tyler, are intriguing, much more important is where it came from on the morning of November 22nd. Dallas. And that's why I read this, so that you know that Bush was on a private plane that uh, it uh, flew from Dallas to Tyler on the day the president was shot. So going back to look at the speech he was giving in Tyler, which I'm saying started at 1.35, and uh, looking up in the right-hand corner here, the flight time from Dallas to Tyler, Texas is 40 minutes. They're pretty close, aren't they? And so if if Bush is beginning his speech at 135 in Tyler and the flight is 40 minutes then that means he's got about 20 minutes to get from where he's standing north of Elm Street on Houston right next to an automobile by the way to get from there to Love Field and then he's got his flight and then uh, say it takes him 10 minutes to get to Love Field and on the plane it's a private plane. It can be ready to go when he wants it ready to go. 40 minutes to get to Tyler. Then he's still got another 10 minutes to get to the Kiwanis Club and begin his speech. It works out perfectly. Uh, so here is a timing explanation which proves that George Bush could have been in Dallas and he could have been standing on Houston Street right where I say he was. And this call to the FBI about James Parrott is a sleazy alibi he's setting up for himself. He's getting it onto the record, into the FBI documents, that he is not in Dallas at the time the president is shot. He's in Tyler, Texas, and he's even trying to help find the real killer, James Parrott. So this is a sleazy alibi. That's why he called the FBI with this silly tip, which was absolutely silly. I'm not going to go through the whole thing here, but you read about what happened. There's no way he could have thought that Parrot had anything to do with it. This was just an excuse to get it on the record that George was in Tyler. And that means he was in Dallas when the president was shot, because why would he do this otherwise? I think it is fair to ask, where was George?